Good morning. Good morning. Well, good morning and welcome to the Overland Park Chamber's Executive Leadership Series, Insights from the Top. I'm Bill Ferguson, President and CEO of Central Bank of the Midwest, and I also serve as the Chairman of the Board of the Directors of Overland Park Chamber. We're happy to finally be back in person um, for many of our events. That's, that's very good news. Um, also, uh, very excited to welcome virtual attendees. So we're a hybrid event today where we've got virtual folks that are joining us online. Appreciate that. And uh, thank you for all of you uh, being here as well. This series of executive leadership is a result of the Board of Directors' vision to create unique programs which focus on executive leadership talent that we have right here in our community, right here at home. This, morning pro this morning's program certainly does that, and I'm sure you'll agree. First, I'd like to recognize the Chamber's corporate partners, Advent Health, Black & Veatch, Central Bank of the Midwest, Menorah Medical Center, Overland Park Regional Center, St. Luke's Health System, and T-Mobile. Would representatives from any of those partners please stand and be recognized? Thank you. Now I'd like to thank the corporate sponsors, Affinis Corp, Community of America Credit Union, Empower Retirement, Evergy, FNBO, Folston Siefkin, J.E. Dunn Construction Company, Johnson County Community College, Kansas Gas Service, McCowan Gordon Construction, University of Kansas Edwards Campus, and University of Kansas Health Systems. Would representatives from the corporate sponsors please stand and thank you for your support. Please welcome the following elected officials who have joined us here this morning. Stacy Graham, Overland Park City Council. Greg Musel, Johnson County Community College, Board of Trustees. And actually, I believe he's virtual, Paul Snyder, Johnson County Community College, Board of Trustees. Thank you all for joining us today. I'd also like to show appreciation for First National Bank of Omaha, FNBO, for partnering with the Chamber as the presenting sponsor of this series. Thank you for your continued support. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Matt Sheets, Market President of FNBO. We're proud to partner with FNBO in bringing this series and a greater focus on executive leadership to the Overland Park business community. Matt, thank you for your continued support and for FNBO's sponsorship. Good morning, everyone. Aren't you lucky to have back-to-back -back bankers? What a way to start the day. <laughs> so I appreciate everybody attending the event as well as virtually and in person, and it's great to be back in person. So at FNBO, we're committed as an organization to our active involvement in helping our customers and the communities that we serve to grow and to thrive. Effective leadership defines and establishes our respective missions, our why for what we do. We also believe that leadership doesn't exclusively reside at the top of the organizational chart. Rather, leadership opportunities exist for every individual regardless of title or position. Leadership is critical for successful businesses, organizations, communities, and society at large which is why we sponsor this leadership series. We have had excellent speakers in the past, and today's speaker fits that description as well. Brenda Sharp was raised in western Kansas. She graduated from K-State with a bachelor's and a master's degree. She moved to Kansas City approximately 30 years ago and has been a 15-year resident of Overland Park. Brenda's formative and academic experiences guided her 
to her career in being active in the betterment of society. She has been a senior executive for more than 30 years with demonstrated success in nonprofit management and administration. In 2004, Brenda became the president and CEO of Reach Healthcare Foundation. It's a charitable organization dedicated to improving access and quality of healthcare for poor and medically underserved individuals through financial support and initiatives. The foundation was organized uh, with the proceeds from the sale of Health Midwest to HCA back in 2003, formally became a charitable organization in 2004, and was initially funded with $100 million of assets and has subsequently raised more dollars since that point in time. Brenda's approach to leadership is to achieve, for REACH Healthcare can be defined as problem solving, collaboration, and consensus building among various constituencies. This morning we will hear about Brenda's leadership views and learn about REACH Healthcare Foundation. It's my pleasure to introduce Brenda Sharp. Thank you, Matt. I really appreciate your leadership and First National Bank sponsorship of this um, series and, and bringing me here today. And I want to thank Tracy, my good friend for many, many years um, here at the Chamber for allowing me this opportunity. Um, and I also want to say good morning to all of you. Good morning to everyone who's here with us virtually, including, I understand from Tracy this morning, my husband, who's watching uh, uh, via television uh, from Wichita this morning. So good morning, honey. <laughs> <laughs> this has been um, a request that has plagued me for almost a month <laughs> after <laughs> Tracy met. And so I wanted to just share with you a little bit about why that is. Um, as a nonprofit executive for 30 years, I'm regularly asked and frequently asked to talk about what I do or what my organization does and, and the important work that we do. And I'm very comfortable talking about that. I can talk to anybody all day long about what all of the nonprofits that I've served do and have done. But when you're asked to talk about your own leadership journey, it's a much different story. <laughs> and and um, even last night, I was having stress dreams that you all like just started continuing on with the program while I was talking. So, um, <laughs> so thank you and bear with me. I'm no TED talker. Um, I am going to use some notes, but I will try to make this more of a dialogue and, and would love to have any interaction and questions that, that you may have. I, as I was preparing my remarks, I really wondered what could I share with you that's different um, from a nonprofit leadership ex perspective as opposed to for profit? Because the fact is, we have a lot in common in, the, in um, these positions. We worry about personnel, we worry about making budget, we worry about our finances, we worry about you know, the bottom line and how we're going to pay our people and pay our bills. Um, those are all things that nonprofit executives have to do. Um, and for-profit executives. In the nonprofit world, I don't make a widget. I don't provide a, a professional service to someone that I'm reimbursed for. But what I do is try to develop enough margin uh, so that our mission can be fulfilled. And that's, I think, one of the key differences and that I'll be sharing a little bit more about that. I've also um, had the experience and observation that um, some people think being a nonprofit leader is somehow easier than being a for-profit leader, and I, I have some friends here who lead nonprofits as well who've had that experience. I've had many informational interviews that I've done for folks who want to leave the for-profit sector because they want to go to a less stressful <laughs> job, and <clears throat> I tend to let them know it's not exactly how, how it works. and, and uh, Sometimes it's a little bit different situation. So um, my 30-year career has really led me to challenge some of those assertions. And today I'd like to just share with you some of the lessons that I've learned um, and share with you a little bit about why I think the nonprofit sector is so critically important to our quality of life here in, in Overland Park. So first, just a little bit of background about me. I am the president and CEO of the REACH Healthcare Foundation. We are a regional philanthropy located here in Overland Park. 
Our mission is to achieve health equity through coverage and care for underserved people in our six county service area. We serve Johnson, Wyandotte, and Allen counties in Kansas, Jackson, Cass, and Lafayette in Missouri. For the past 17 years, I've led a really small team of dedicated colleagues in support of our mission, and I report to a board of directors of 17 members. They're very diverse, incredibly talented and competent, and a few of them are probably online and in, in this room uh, today that have been associated with our organization, and uh, two of our lead grantee partners are here as well, Julie and, and Amy. It's good to see them as well. I've also had the privilege and honor to serve a number of community, state, and national organizations and efforts, including Forward OP a few years ago, and I'm currently a member of the Johnson County Charter Commission. And if you have any questions or concerns about either Forward OP or the Charter Commission, please see Greg Musil after today's program. <laughs> My time with REACH has been amazing. I was the first person hired by a then 27-member um, appointed board of directors. Um, as Matt mentioned, we were created from the sale of the old Health Midwest nonprofit healthcare system to HCA. And um, this is called a conversion foundation. So all of those charitable assets that have been built up in that nonprofit system over the years, when it was purchased by a for-profit entity, um, the attorneys general in Kansas and Missouri sued that transaction in order to protect those charitable assets and keep them in our community as opposed to being exported out um, to another, another community. So, that's how we have um, these, this foundation, which is the REACH Healthcare Foundation, and our sister foundation, the Health Forward Foundation, which is located in Kansas City, Missouri, and has the same six county footprint that we do. We were essentially tasked as an initial body with forming a, a charitable philanthropy, an endowment that was uh, mandated to exist into perpetuity. So it wasn't as though we could spend all this money on current need. We were really um, charged with investing it in the markets and then using the proceeds from those investments to make grants um, to other nonprofits in the, in the community. The settlement agreement ultimately involves seven different teams of attorneys, and no offense to the attorneys in the room, but more attorneys does not necessarily guarantee a better end product when it comes to the creation of legal documents. It took our board almost two years to kind of reconcile all of the discrepancies that had developed amongst the various aspects of forming uh, this foundation, but uh, we did. The REACH board at its inception was huge, but had many talented people, most of whom were deeply concerned with the high percentage of people in our region who were lacking health insurance and access to, to quality care. Our board members were appointed by then Governor Kathleen Sebelius, um, then Attorney General Phil Klein, the Senate and House Majority and Minority Leaders, three area county commissions, Johnson, Wyandotte, and Allen counties, and the buying and selling entities, HCA and Health Midwest. <clears throat> and those of you who are around at the time may recall a lot of those people deeply despised one another um, and <laughs> had very specific ideas about what their appointees to this original board would or would not do and how they wanted to see these monies invested and, and ultimately used. Just as an example, uh, my original board included <clears throat> the executive director of the Kansas Democratic Party, the chair of the Kansas Republican Party, board members of Kansans for Life and Planned Parenthood, supporters of nationalized health care and those of free market health solutions and everything in between. I was 35 years old when I was hired as the first um, employee and, and CEO. And I had come from a direct service nonprofit organization where everybody was there for the mission. That's just what, what we did. And uh, I was absolutely unprepared for the political um, and ideological challenges that we're going to face this organization and, and the people involved. Oftentimes, our votes on um, specific agenda items were 14 to 13. And I'd never been on a, on, on a part of a nonprofit board that really had split votes on much of anything. So it was very unique and, and different situation. Um, I've learned a lot about how policy and ideology can come together or, or divide us, and, and I'll share a little bit more about that. But what became really clear in those early years was just how important board governance is, uh, really strong board governance and leadership. 
a commitment to transparency um, is paramount, and having strong, experienced, and unapologetic leadership. I was blessed to have Mark Parkinson, soon to be governor, as my first board chair, and Bob Rainier of Bank of Blue Valley, many of you know, as my second board chair. And I credit their straightforward, kind of no nonsense, no drama, a, a, a very warm and authentic leadership approach to helping us get past some of those early hurdles. And I will tell you, if the persons who had run against them um, had become the leaders of this foundation, not only would I not be here today, but also the, the way these monies were used and invested for the greater good would be very, very different than um, uh, where we're at uh, now. The first board hired me. Um, it was very, everything came together very fast. All this litigation, lawsuits, there was a settlement. Um, these 27 people were appointed. They started meeting and arguing and, and they didn't really know where to go, but they decided they wanted to go with a strong CEO model and hire someone first to help unravel all this and figure this out. Um, there are about 120 applicants, I understand, for that position. And I went through six rounds of interviews. Um, ultimately was interviewed in a final round by the 27 um, uh, folks. And it was the worst interview I've ever done in my life. It was horrifying and I went home and some of you know uh, the folks from EFL. Uh, they were running this search and uh, they and Mark Parkinson who is the chair called me <clears throat> and I immediately apologized. I said, I'm so sorry, I just completely tanked that interview. I'm, I let you down, I can't believe I've spent six months of my life doing this and dragging you through this. And they said, oh, well, we were calling to offer you the job, actually. <laughs> uh, everybody did really poorly. We really did a terrible job setting up that interview. <laughs> so um, that was kind of a, you know, my first exposure to even when you think you've done a really crap job, sometimes it's okay, and so leaders need to remember, we're always hardest on, our, our, on ourselves. Um, but the board also failed to tell me, uh, and probably because they just had, had time to really put their ducks in a row, and they didn't know how to run a nonprofit necessarily, they did not have their 501c3 designation from the IRS yet, nor did they have any money. Um, <laughs> So I worked for free for the first three months for this $100 million organization out of the loft in my bedroom. And um, I remember my husband saying, what kind of job is this? Uh, <laughs> you're putting stuff on our credit card? How do you know we're going to get reimbursed for this? <laughs> and um, So it was, it was an interesting start. I couldn't even get a Kinko's account because we had no credit, we didn't have an organization. And so I'll just tell you, if you're ever in a startup business mode, UPS is your friend. They have much lower standards than the <laughs> Kinkos do. And if you're from UPS, I don't mean that uh, in a bad way. Um, my first board was deeply divided about what it meant to be a health philanthropy and how to fulfill our charge of helping the uninsured, but we plowed ahead, eventually finding consensus points amongst a solid bipartisan majority around our important mission. And this was really the second time in my career, and I'll tell you more about the first, but this is where I learned to employ, generally speaking, the 80-20 rule. If 80% of my board was ready to move and act and add a consensus point on something, we went forward. I worked really hard to bring that other 20% along to document their concerns, kind of create a minority report, if you will. Um, understand and listen to them, but at the end of the day, we had to move forward. And what happened then, and you see this all the time, it's happening now, 20 that 20% is usually really, really vocal. Um, and you can become distracted from the objective if you get hung up on trying to bring all of them along. But you know, you do, you do try, and it's important to make that effort, but you do have to move ahead eventually. And that 80-20 rule has come into play in my career so many times. Um, it, it's, it's maybe that tipping point, many of you have read that book. It, it's um, once you're at that 80%, you can feel pretty good that your ambassadors, if you will, are going to be saying the right things when you're out in the community. If you don't do that hard work, the worst thing that can happen is your supposed ambassadors are actually undermining your own, your own leadership and your own um, organization's mission and, and the work. And I, so, so I think it is very important to do. Um, having those hard conversations first, listening to devil's advocates. I love to have devil's advocates on my board. I like to just you know debate and banter and question and, 
and really dig into that because then as we go out into the community, we're a much more united front. Um, one other quick aside that I just I have to share this tip because it's been one that I've used so many times um, from uh, Governor Parkinson. When we would have these lengthy board discussions about difficult conversations, what kinds of things were we going to fund? For instance, HPV um, vaccine was something we were uh, looking at, and this was very controversial at the time. Uh, if you can imagine, there were, I had a contingency on my board who said, if you give girls the, va the HPV vaccine, they'll become more sexually promiscuous. So this is kind of what we were dealing with. And we had our public health folks saying, this prevents cancer. Um, this is something we need, need to support. But what Mark would say when we would get into these and things have been going on a while, he would say, have we discussed this enough? And I found this to be really powerful because it kind of stopped the folks who feel like they have to repeat everybody else just but to make sure they're heard. Um, it stops the folks who, you know, kind of mansplain, uh, <laughs> if you will, or that feel like they just need to hear themselves speak. But it also leaves the window open for someone who has not maybe contributed and feels like they, they do need that airspace. And so I, um, I've used that, that technique quite a bit. And, and it, uh, you might try it the next time you're on a Zoom call that's going on endlessly. Uh, <laughs> We began making grants at REACH back in 2005 to strengthen the local health care safety net, bridge the coverage divide through advocacy for sound public health policy, and most importantly, we worked to close the coverage um, equity gap and care uh, equity gap, which has created a health care system that, in my mind, um, tends to take better care of us if we have a laminated card in our pocket than if we don't. And so that kind of sums up where I, I, I feel we are um, in our health care system today. Um, but today I'm proud to say that our foundation, which is located just down Metcalf at uh, the new Avenue 82 building, uh, we have $150 million in assets um, after that original 100 and we have given away nearly $75 million since our inception in support of our mission. We have helped thousands of people receive life-saving care from community health clinics and community mental health centers. We've influenced policymakers to expand Medicaid in Missouri. Kansas, you are up next. We are now surrounded all by states who've expanded Medicaid, but we have not. And we've worked to reduce disparities by investing more heavily in black-led, black-serving organizations and efforts to create a more welcoming community for immigrants and refugees in our region. Uh, they are such an important um, part of our um, economy and cultural fabric. We pivoted really hard during COVID to undergird the region's critical safety net. Uh, we redeployed about a million and a half dollars last year that was allocated to other things um, and increased our giving by about $500,000 in order to serve those needs. So enough about REACH for now. I was informed by Tracy that this series isn't necessarily about sharing what I do now, but I have to do that because that's what I do. Um, but more about my leadership journey. How did I get here? What have I learned? Um, along the way. Many of you have been part of that leadership journey and just amazingly, as always happens to me in almost every place I go, um, I am from a very small town in western Kansas called Dighton, Kansas. Very, very tiny. And a gentleman came up to me today, Eric, and was a sophomore in high school when I was a uh, senior. And he said, weren't you the yearbook editor? When, and I said, <laughs> yes. <laughs> So um, he can fact check me on uh, some of my, my journey here. Um, I did a lot of research to prepare. I watched a lot of videos and uh, to a T, they all just knocked it out of the park. So um, uh, I'll, I'll do my best here. According to a report produced by UMKC's Midwest Center for Nonprofit Leadership, the Kansas City region had 10,545 nonprofits registered with the IRS. That number does not include religious organizations. They range from small volunteer-led organizations focused on a particular interest or a hobby, like the baseball collectors of Kansas City, if you will, up to a very large anchor uh, organizations like Children's Mercy Hospital. And that's a lot of nonprofits. And are any of you surprised by that? I saw a couple of eyebrows go up. That's a lot of nonprofits. In 2020, charitable nonprofits in Kansas City reported total income of $19.6 billion, and total assets of the sector were more than $29 billion. Kansas City's charitable nonprofit sector accounted for 11.5% of the Kansas City Metropolitan Statistical Area's Gross Metropolitan Product, or GMP, in 2018. So almost 12% of our area's GMP 
comes from the nonprofit sector. Most people are surprised by those numbers, and on any other day, I would you know, give you a long talk about what makes a good charity and, and how to look for the signs of what to um, give your money to. But for today, I'll just say, make sure you renew your membership in this charity, the Overland Park Chamber um, of Commerce, and Tracy didn't pay me to say that. <laughs> today, uh, to date, I have been employed by five different nonprofits. I've served on the boards of about a dozen, and I've interacted with hundreds. My current job at REACH sometimes feels like a dream that I didn't know was possible. I mean, who ever thought that there was a job out there where you get to give away $5 million a year? And certainly not a girl from Western Kansas. And try explaining this job to your um, family at Thanksgiving dinner. It's, <clears throat> most people say at the end of that, how do I get a grant from the REACH Foundation? Um, prior to REACH, I accepted my first executive director job at the ripe old age of 25 years old with Child Abuse Prevention Coalition of Johnson County. That's actually where I met Greg Musil. I was green, passionate, and simultaneously thrilled and terrified. I was also not very clear on who I was at my core at the time I took that job. So let me explain that a little bit. My first three nonprofit jobs before the Child Abuse Prevention Coalition were at an alcohol and drug prevention center, a domestic violence shelter, and a rape crisis center. Do you see a theme? I did not. <laughs> Unconsciously, I was drawn to jobs that resonated with me personally, but I wasn't being honest with myself about why. After receiving my master's degree in school counseling at K-State, I simply knew I did not want to be a high school counselor, and more on that irony later. I only knew that I wanted to help people. And what that meant at me for the time was providing direct services. So I was leading um, support groups for young children of alcoholics early on. I did um, support groups for adult survivors of child sexual abuse. I did date rape presentations in every middle school and high school, I think, in, in the area. Um, I was good at taking care of people who were experiencing horrible, horrific crises, and um, I think I was good at it, but I also noticed I was becoming increasingly more and more anxious. I was becoming more cynical about the world. I was being exposed to these horrific atrocities that people commit not only to themselves but onto other people. On more than one occasion, I risked my own personal safety to drive to Fort Riley to pick up women, their children, and their belongings while their armed husbands were drilling out in the field. Often, those women and children returned home the very next day. Most um, women uh, who are battered do. They will return seven to ten times before leaving a final time. This was my job. Uh, these were normal to me. I wasn't trained. I didn't get a lot of training for any of these jobs. You're just one of the uh, downsides of the nonprofit sector is if you sign up, you are just going to do a bunch of stuff. And it doesn't matter if it's in your job description or not, you're going to be doing lots and lots of, of things. But I was starting to feel something else burbling up inside of me. Just under the surface, it was unacknowledged. And I learned later that I was struggling with vicarious trauma which was triggering my own traumatic childhood experiences. When I took the job at the Child Abuse Prevention Coalition, a Kansas City Star reporter named um, Laura Hockaday, some of you may remember her, she was the social writer for the Star back when we had newspapers and they were on paper. Um, and I just still don't know how I came to her attention, but she um, interviewed me and she was just wonderful. She was marvelous. She was curious. She just asked so many questions and I had no experience with journalists. <laughs> and so it was just a conversation to me and we were just talking, but she asked these very insightful questions. And I told her things that I hadn't admitted to myself before that day very publicly. And once she published that article, <laughs> It was like my worlds collide. I was the um, kind of work all day and night, c totally committed to other people, just kind of going forward and doing things. And then I was this vulnerable person <clears throat> who had these things that had happened to me, and I had to work to bring them together. And that, that article was the start of that. And it was very scary, <laughs> scary as hell. And any of you have been on that same kind of journey, and I know that many people in this room has just have just statistically, when you start to talk about those things that led you to be a leader and led you to be in the career that you're at, and, and you have to reconcile that personal side of you with your professional, 
it's, it's kind of hard, and it takes, it takes a lot of work. But the personal work that I did at that time, mostly acknowledging that I was human and that what had happened to me wasn't my fault, allowed me the opportunity to become a more authentic person and leader. I learned that by sharing my own vulnerabilities at the appropriate time while also demonstrating good boundaries, I hope, I could give voice to issues that others may find uncomfortable or even controversial, allowing me to impact others in my community in a unique way. The Child Abuse Prevention Coalition was a small organization, very low budget, focused squarely on the education of children and parents and mandated reporters. But unfortunately, what we saw time and again was that when children would report their abuse, um, they would be re-traumatized by the very system established to um, take care of them. They might be interviewed seven to ten times subsequent to that initial disclosure by a well-intentioned school counselor or nurse or a teacher, um, police detectives, child protective social workers, um, district attorneys, parents. Um, these kids would be so traumatized that what happens is their story changes. They stop talking. They um, are afraid of the repercussions or they're afraid that the abuser, which is sometimes a person in their family, um, is going to be taken from their home. Uh, they stop talking and you get very low, um, uh, very poor quality investigations and very low prosecution rates. So in the mid, um, late 90s, a new model came along called the Child Advocacy Center, and this is where you bring a very highly trained forensic interviewer who's trained in child development, and when a child makes a disclosure, very quickly you bring that child to a safe and child-friendly location, and all of the other people that normally do the interview are watching the interview over closed circuit television, and it's recorded, and then you can use the recording in lieu of the child being forced to testify over and over again. And um, this increases, as you can imagine, the quality of the investigation. It reduces the trauma to the child and increases prosecutions. So all of that seems logical. At the time, this was a very controversial process because every detective I ever met thought they did a great job. Um, they didn't think about the fact that they're in a police uniform and um, sometimes, you know, sometimes they were plain clothes, but um, everybody thought that they did the best job interviewing kids and giving up that power and control over to somebody else to do this interview was very challenging. Um, I was asked to be on the board and to raise money for this other group when they wanted to start a child advocacy here in Kansas City, <laughs> advocacy center in Kansas City. And I said, well, wait a minute, it's all the same supporters and the, same people we're gonna be going to for money and the same board leadership, why wouldn't we just merge? And so um, we merged the Child Abuse Prevention Coalition um, with this new Child Advocacy Center concept and we became uh, Sunflower House. And um, Sunflower House serves Johnson and Wyandotte County. Um, but what we had to do then was develop protocols with 21 police jurisdictions in Wyandotte and Johnson counties, two state child protective services offices, two district attorneys, forensic medical examiners, and others. So this was my first experience of people who didn't always like each other very much, didn't trust each other very much, um, but coming together. And what I learned there is that everyone agreed on the goal. They didn't necessarily agree on how to get there. And so it was our job to find that path forward. And again, relinquishing that um, authority and trust to a different person that you know, you're not sure if they're gonna do the job as good as you or as well as you um, was very hard. So again, that 80-20 rule came into play. And once I had convinced a couple of detectives, crusty, um, older, just, you know, nobody can, want, but once they got it and once they felt it in their heart, they were the best advocates to go around and convince those other people that this, this needed to happen. Um, so Sunflower House was born. We then had to raise 2.2 million to build a facility that could accommodate the advocacy center and that was hard. But again, I saw firsthand the messenger mattered. Cops listened to cops. Donors listened to their peer group and donors give for lots and lots of different reasons. Um, some because of their moral code, others because of peer pressure, still others they might just like the accolades or seeing their name on a plaque, that's okay, we'll, we'll give you a plaque. Uh, part of my job has, and it still remains, remembering um, to put my ego aside that I don't have to be the messenger all the time, that some, I can train people up and help other people deliver the message in a way that's going to result in the best outcome. 
one of the most painful lessons I learned at some firehouse and reach is that my judgment is not infallible. And we all like to think that we're great judges of character, that we can spot a criminal or a snake oil salesman because we just have really good instincts about people. Do you all believe that about yourself? Everybody does. And when you worked your entire career to date, helping um, others learn to spot predators, you've become very convinced of your own radar. You think you've just really got that down. But a community leader with whom I had worked closely for years, who had mentored me and had been a staunch advocate for those less fortunate, was exposed to be, in fact, fallible and human. He made some terrible, irreversible mistakes that hurt many people I cared about, and I just couldn't believe the trust and faith that I had placed in that person for so many years. I felt really betrayed, and I was angry. But it was a learning experience for me. What I took away is that sometimes the higher your aspirations as a leader and the greater your success and the more power you accumulate, the more susceptible you are to overestimating your own importance or to be influenced by people who convince you that the rules don't apply to you. So today, anytime I'm in danger of getting too big for my britches, I remind myself that I'm lucky to be in the position I have as opposed to deserving to be in this position. And I hope that you will think about that a, a little bit as well. I also keep a rock on my desk that says integrity, given to me by Dan Stalp almost 20 years ago, who did something that I encourage all of you to do as well. He nominated me for the Ingram's 40 Under 40. And when he called and said he was doing that, I'm like, why? What are you talking about? I don't, I, what? Uh, yeah, I didn't even know really what it was. But it was those kinds of um, recognition that allowed other people to see something in me and get some exposure that allowed me ultimately to move on in my next uh, career. So thank you, Dan, for that. It was quite a gift. One of the few downsides of my current role is that people don't, who didn't know me um, before 20 years ago or so make certain assumptions about me. Eric will not. Um, <laughs> he knew me. Most often, they assume I came from wealth and privilege. Although they're correct about the latter, I certainly have privilege as a white woman. It's undeserved. Um, but they, many people are surprised to learn that I grew up relatively poor. I was raised primarily by a single mom who worked hard but struggled with a significant mental health diagnosis. I was fathered sporadically by my dad who immigrated to this country with his mom and brother after World War II and who suffered from the effects of a lifelong addiction to alcohol. In fact, someone at my table here, Gina, um, is from Valley Hope and I remember going to Valley Hope to visit my dad when I was 12 years old. Um, I was the first in my family and one of a few in my extended family to attend college. Um, although I was poor, my mom was a single parent though, I, I was still privileged. I had my uh, mom and dad's extended family, lots of aunts and uncles. Uh, my grandmother, who also was an immigrant to this country, just poured all of her hopes and dreams into me. She made the ultimate sacrifice to bring her family here to a tiny town that literally when she arrived, she. Um, it was basically, it looks like a dust bowl out there certain times of year and it's about the time she uh, arrived and she came from Austria, mountains and springs and trees and she said, where are the trees? Um, what at, what's happening here? Um, I was also privileged because I was book smart, I loved to read, I was a people pleaser, I was a white girl in rural America during a time when public education was adequately valued and so I got good grades <clears throat> and I was able to attend K-State um, on scholarships. So there's a lot to unpack there, but I won't, because I know that almost every leader, and every person in this room, and all of you online, has just as unique an origin story, one that has influenced and shaped who you are today. One difference for me, though, perhaps, is that I've learned not to shy away from my story and why I'm choosing to share some of that with you today, as difficult as it sometimes is. Instead of fighting and avoiding those difficult, sometimes unspeakable experiences that influenced your leadership opportunities and style, I encourage you to embrace them. Come to terms with them and integrate them into you and who you are and the kind of leader that you are. Try to be your most authentic self and create an environment where others feel free to do the same. I've had benefactors of every kind over my life, relatives who I knew would take me in if my parents could no longer care for me, which was a reality on many, many occasions teachers who pushed me, people who shared their wealth with me in the form of scholarships, mentors who advised me, and friends and colleagues who have forgiven me when I didn't deserve it. Um, I have to step back frequently and realize I didn't arrive in any of these leadership roles on my own. There was always someone there 
um, my own talent or perseverance or personality, you know, they might matter, but none of us get into these positions because we're inherently special. The fact is other people see something special in us, they reinforce it, they make room for us and ultimately allow us the opportunity to lead. Many of the causes I've championed over my career were controversial at the time. When I worked at MOXA, their local rape crisis center early in my career, Adult survivors of child abuse and sexual assault were just beginning to report what had happened to them, many for the first time. I spoke to a woman on the crisis line who was 80 years old. Um, at that time, it was 30 years ago, it was the first time she had disclosed her child's sexual abuse to anyone, but she wanted somebody to hear it before she died. Whole organizations sprung up at that time to discount and deny those lived experiences of survivors, but we would not be quiet. And this was 30 years before the Me Too movement. REACH's entire purpose is to help people who are uninsured access affordable health care. Medicaid expansion is one of the best paths forward to ensure more than 150,000 hardworking Kansans, most of whom are working in jobs that just don't offer health care coverage. If you make more than $8,000 a year in Kansas and you're single without a child, you are too rich for our state's Medicaid program. This is unconscionable to me, and it's the reason I talk about this issue anywhere and everywhere I go, including today. Over the years, I have been yelled at, threatened, followed, written about, dismissed, and reviled, but I refuse to be quiet. I do not respond well to bullies. There's plenty of evidence that playground bullies often grow up to be, well, adult bullies. <laughs> and when left unchecked and unchallenged, they grow up to be boss bullies or elected bullies. And um, I feel like it's inherent upon me and incumbent upon me to check that occasionally. So I get a little out there sometimes, as Greg will attest recently with Johnson County Charter Commission. Um, <laughs> sometimes being in this type of leadership role, advocating for controversial issues feels a little lonely, as though you're swimming upstream for years. But every time I do speak up, someone thanks me for it. It turns out a lot of people think like me but some are scared to speak their minds for fear of be being discounted or they feel like they don't have the exact words to fully articulate their argument for something, they just know it's true. Every time I give voice to a firmly held belief, which by the way, I try to back up with facts and evidence, I'm giving voice to someone else who feels they have none and that's how change begins to happen, harnessing the power of many voices. Even when my timing isn't perfect, I firmly believe it's important to address societal wrongs way before they reach that tipping point. I've never ended up walking the path alone, but the people walking alongside me grows every day, every week, every year. Because the time always comes when what once seemed impossible is in fact possible. To quote Martin Luther King Jr., the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. And I really believe this, but I would add to that only when we speak up and act. It doesn't happen on its own. So I want to come back to my earlier mention real quick of that high school um, counselor situation. I could have been a high school counselor, and thankfully K-State puts you in an actual school in a classroom to make sure that's what you want to do, and I quickly said, mm -mm, no, that's not, not for me. Um, I also shared I was a first-generation college student. My mom and dad became pregnant while still in high school and had a child. My older brother, who sadly died 18 months later, several years before I was born, um, was the reason that they were married. College was out of reach for my parents. Not only was there no money for it, but both had experienced multiple traumas by that point that would have made their success in college unlikely. But fortunately, in Dighton, I had a host of teachers and administrators who believed in me and encouraged me to apply for college, even though my mom and I had no idea how we were gonna pay for it. But not everyone in college, uh, in, in my hometown, thought college was a good idea for me. Most notably, my high school counselor, who shall remain unnamed, but Eric will know his name. And I think he still works in education in this state today. So I'm gonna call him Dr. Needles. Although I knew Dr. Needles, of course, for several years, my high school graduating class had 24 people in it. The first time we really spoke to one another for any length of time was for that obligatory post-high school plans, you know, that you have to have with your, your counselor. Um, to this day, I can remember where we were seated, what his office looked like. I can remember just about every detail of that meeting. 
And here I was with my high school counselor, the person who colleges contact about prospective students, and the world was my oyster. I had straight A's, a very good ACT score, and I was valedictorian in my graduating class, albeit I know it's 24 people, so it's not. Right. And here he was. I was so excited to hear his ideas of how I should go about this exciting new chapter of my life. And what he did next, in fact, changed the trajectory of my life. Despite my academic achievements, the leadership roles and extracurricular activities in which I'd engaged, and none of which he acknowledged, he mentioned instead my personal circumstances, my upbringing, my limited financial position. He proceeded to encourage me to enroll in a program just 35 miles from home, so if it didn't work out, I wouldn't have as far to fail, or far to fall. And I remember feeling like I'd just been slapped in the face. It hadn't mattered how hard I'd worked to overcome any of these circumstances, or even that the community college was a good one, in fact, and really important to our local economy there. But he knew I, I had dreams and aspirations that I had shared with him. All he saw were my limited, uh, his assumed limited, my assumed limited um, limitations and the circumstances that were totally beyond my control to that point. He was providing me options that he thought best for me, knowing very little about who I was at my core. And that's when I learned a really painful but eventually freeing life lesson. Some adults, and some people are idiots. <laughs> Some adults say and do the dumbest things. Some adults shouldn't be trusted or listened to because they don't know you and they don't know what's best for you. But unfortunately, most kids do listen to adults. They believe them and can be unduly influenced by careless words. But on that day, I decided I was done being one of those kids and I could and would make my own way. And off I went to K-State on a hodgepodge of scholarships one of which I received after driving to the Dodge City, Kansas Elks Lodge on the day the application was due, one day after I learned I could apply for it, and about a week after that meeting with Dr. Needles. And here's what I learned from that experience. A lot of adults are smart. They want to help. They believe in you for no other reason than your inherent worth and their own generosity of spirit. It's okay to ask them for help and trust others. It's okay to want more, see a different future for yourself, and steer your own course. And because of that experience with Elks Lodge, I have never since turned down an opportunity to speak what I call the animal clubs, the Elks, the Moose, the um, Kiwanis, the Rotary, the Chamber. If you ask, I will come and, and speak to your group. These are the people, including this group, that think beyond today. They're thinking about the community of the future. They're thinking about the young people who are going to be sitting in these chairs 20 and 30 years from now instead of only themselves. My family benefited from publicly funded health insurance when my mom left her job due to gender discrimination and a realization that no matter how hard she worked, she would never be promoted. She went on to get other jobs and provide for our family. My high school English and band teachers told me to apply to K-State. They read all of my scholarship applications and helped me make it happen. My aunts and uncles and parents of friends opened their homes to me when my mom was hospitalized. My grandmother told me stories of her homeland so that I could envision a world bigger than the town in which I was raised. Every single step of my leadership journey has been marked by a bend in the universe in my direction. I, I stole that from a presentation I heard at the United, Way, uh, United We event a couple weeks ago, and I, I really thought about that. It's just always bent a little bit in my direction by one or more people seeing something in me that I did not, by believing me when I could not by investing me when others would not, every single step. So really, I guess it was ultimately the people that were bending <laughs> the universe in my direction. So what some would call luck or the resilience that comes from surviving hardship, I would also point out is just as often due to the generosity of spirit and sharing by others for no better reason than it just feels good to them and it's the right thing to do. I'll close with saying it's no small irony that my closest friend in the world, aside from my husband, of course, hi, honey, um, <laughs> is a school social worker named Cindy Bariga. She's here at my house waiting for me um, <laughs> to be done with this so we can start a little vacation. Each day of her career, dozens of times a day, she comes across a young version of Brenda. Each evening she has the choice of not returning to work the next day. She's frequently exhausted and sometimes afraid for her personal safety, especially now, and so are her students. She's exposed to and forced to reconcile the unspeakable traumas and living experiences and circumstances imposed upon many of her students.
by the very people who should be caring for them. And she's expected to undo what those kids have learned at home in a public education system that is chronically underfunded and derided as wasteful. But the message she sends every day, even when she's too tired to actually say the words just by showing up is, I'm here, I'm listening, you matter, there is more out here, keep going, don't give up. I'm going to guess that nearly everyone in this room has a Dr. Needles or a Cindy Bariga in their past, and probably both. You're hopefully picturing them right now, and I hope you'll take some time today, or maybe later this week, to reflect on their role, in addition to your own hard work and ingenuity, of course, that helped shape you to be the person and the leader that you are today. And maybe just give them a call, or drop a note, or shoot them an email. Even your Dr. Needles, who you can tell that you turned out pretty well despite him giving you crappy advice. After all, everyone makes mistakes and everyone deserves a chance to grow. Thank you. If anyone has questions for Brenda, we do have a mic here that um, for the virtual attendees so they can hear. So if you raise your hand, we will get the mic to you. <laughs> Three things. One, I can't imagine Overland Park, Johnson County, or Kansas without Brenda in it. So kudos to you. Two, I recall leading a Leadership Kansas session um, at Sporting KC, and I was the KC chair, and so I got to pick some of the activities, and I snuck in the conversation on Medicaid expansion, and they said, what? And then I said, I invited Brenda Sharp to be one of the speakers, and they said, what? <laughs> and you hit it out of the park. Really, that different opportunity to share what we need to hear, when we need to hear it, you are gifted at that. Three, I will ask. You commented that Bob Rainier and Mark Parkinson were some of the leadership styles that were important to you. Yet sometimes you can be a real bull in the china shop. And I'm curious what you learned from Bob and Mark about how to get along with people versus forcing your will on them. Because frankly, there are some people in Kansas that need to be dragged, you know, hogtied and dragged into the pen and, and taught a lesson. Where do you get that balance in order to get a 27 group um, along the same page with you? You can come up here. Yeah. Well, I, I will attribute that, Clint. Thank you for your very kind remarks and for always giving me that little window to walk <laughs> into. Um, I attribute that to the Dighton Bowl, which is our local bowling alley and um, diner where all of the farmers come together. It doesn't matter if you're a Republican or Democrat, and they just shoot the bowl um, in, in the mornings. They have their coffee, and um, that kind of atmosphere that I grew up with meant that it didn't matter what political party you were. My grandparents were divided house. Um, my house is a... a a party <laughs> is divided. Um, what mattered is that if your neighbor's wife had cancer and you couldn't um, till the field or harvest the wheat, you went over and did it and you helped them. And that idea of moving past what people initially present you with and, and with those barriers that they're putting up um, and just kind of sticking with them and, and pushing through that, I think, is, is part of that. But also, just civility. Um, I can be a bull in a china shop, and usually it's when somebody has, I perceive them to be bullying me or trying to get me to shut up, which happens a lot when you're a woman in leadership, frankly. Um, but what I saw from Mark and Bob were um, ways that they would just listen, but, you know, again, kind of move on. I, I'll tell you a great story about Bob Rainier that um, I think just makes a perfect point. One of those board members of my early board members who absolutely despised me in this role, she had applied for the job, she wanted the job, she didn't get the job, I got the job. Um, she just never had anything good to say about me or uh, whatever, but she experienced a medical hardship during the time that um, uh, 
we were in those early years. And Bob had, um, she gave Bob a lot of hell in those uh, years as a, as a board member, but Bob had a, an adapted um, van um, that he had had for one of his parents and so that she um, could be mobile. And when this person experienced this crisis, he said, why don't you just take my mom's van and use it? And this person was completely caught off guard. She said, uh, okay, and she used it. And that relationship and dynamic changed 180. So part of it is just pushing past that initial, I don't know, meanness or whatever it is, and, and just showing kindness, I think. Um, I'm challenged in that sometimes with some of the people that you're talking about, but I, I try. <laughs> Anything else? Thank you, Brenda. One of the privileges that I think I have in my life is growing up in small town Kansas. And I, we, we had a, one of these executive leadership series where we had Suze Parker and Steve Wilkinson and I can't remember who else, Ed Eilert on the stage and I got to moderate. And I'm thinking of a Barry Sullivan or other people. Have you tried to identify anything about your upbringing in a small town in Kansas and how that contrasts with raising your two wonderful children and trying to teach them the values you learned in small town Kansas that translate into leadership? I, I think so. I, I, I still think of Kansas City as a big small town. So even when I moved here, and because of my job, I had to go everywhere in town. I didn't know anything about the state line or county lines, or it took me forever to figure out that Wyandotte numbered streets run opposite of Johnson and Jackson, for instance. Um, my husband could barely find his way to the plaza, and he grew up in Stanley. And <laughs> so it was, uh, it was just so foreign to me that you just didn't go everywhere. And so when our kids were in high school, very affluent um, school and, and neighborhood, a lot of their kids you know, had brand new cars, or their friends had brand new cars. They um, were involved in lots of activities, but they, they didn't work a job. And Mike and I talked about this, and we said, we, we've got to do something to to ground them, and so both of our kids worked as servers at Lakeview Village and um, uh, worked with uh, elderly people, and um, both of them learned a lot about customer service <laughs> and um, humility and learned to work for some of those things that their friends were given, and they were resentful um, much of the time that we were doing that, but I remember distinctly when each of them called us back during college and said, God, I'm so glad you made us do that because I, you know, the people that I'm meeting here that have never worked a day in their life are just driving me crazy, that they're, they're seeing in college, just don't appreciate what, what they had. And my kids' college was paid for. We, we, we paid for that. We were able to do that, but we did not want them to not understand the value of that. And, and so I think that is maybe not just small town, but I think just parents who have to come together and figure out how are we going to keep our kids a little more humble when they're growing up in an area that is surrounded by a lot of money, frankly. Okay, you guys have been wonderful and very tolerant and patient and I appreciate all of you and thanks very much. Well, I just have to say, uh, you know how to do TED Talks. That, it was, that was really, really, really good. <laughs> your, uh, your incredible insights, I mean, when you think about some of the things she said, um, you know, earlier when I was talking to Brenda, I think it's just really interesting to hear people's journeys and to hear hers, the challenges she went through it kind of puts a lot of things in perspective for you, and you're very appreciative. Someone like this is in our community helping to lead the community in the right direction. So again, round of applause for Brenda. I would also like to uh, again thank our corporate partners, Advent Health, Black & Veatch, Central Bank of the Midwest, Menorah Medical, and OP Regional Medical Center, T-Mobile, Sprint, and all of our corporate sponsors for their support uh, in the chamber. Now please join me in also appreciating Matt Sheets and FNBO for partnering with the chamber to bring you this executive leadership series. Uh, 
All right, and we are adjourned. Thank you so much for being here today and being virtual.